This week on Security Decoded, you got Dennis, John, and I, and we're going to talk about the cyber attacks on uh, South Korea, Apple adds two-factor authentication, Skype is leaking your location, and Pope spam. All that and more coming up. Welcome to this week's Security Decoded. I'm here with Mike and John. And looks like we have some changes here, don't we, yeah, on, in the okay. studio? We're working on them. Yeah. I'm digging it. That's good stuff. Do, do we call this background the firewall? Is that... Hey, that's a good one. Is that... Uh, yeah, the, I like that. Maybe we could get a little sign, you know, firewall or something yeah, like that. That'd be good. Yeah. Uh, we also have some other changes. Uh, I see that John has come out of his hibernation for winter. <laughs> this is shaved off his beard. Yeah. This is spring cleaning. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, we have lots of uh, good stuff this week, um, and I think that this one is going to be one of the more interesting uh, episodes we had, just because of the different uh, topics we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, but do you know that we can watch, you, you can watch us record Security Decoded every week live. And while you watch, you can join the chat room with other live viewers. We have the chat room in front of us while we record so we can be interactive with you. And something else that's new, uh, we are now also streaming live at justin.tv, that's J-U-S-T-I-N dot TV, and livestream.com. So lots of changes this week. Yep. Well, let's jump right into it. Uh, I think that the most uh, scariest uh, headline that we had was South Korean banks and broadcasting organizations suffer major damage from cyber attack. This one just didn't appear in Krebs and at the usual AV vendor sites, but uh, also it was all over the uh, the news media this week. So, John, what is your, what's your first impression of this? Um, I got to say it's really scary stuff. Um, really, 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 really scary stuff because this isn't um, the primarily identified as a data, data stealer. Uh, you know, you see a lot of things like data stealer or I'm going to redirect you to an ad or um, right now the preliminary analysis across several AV vendors is, is, is just purely just to destroy, wipe drives. And um, I think what's even more impressive is um, it's not targeting a specific OS like a Windows, typically you see most of the malware coded towards Windows. Um, they found a, a Linux component to this. Yeah, I saw that sh- the shutdown command in there for, yeah. for yeah. Linux. So, yeah. And this is the first time uh, that we've seen a package within a package. So they have the Windows attack, and then they have the Windows component, which is going to drop, wipe out your, uh, you know, your kernel, your user, your uh, Etsy, your your home directories. And that pretty much is a re-image uh, from your media, whatever your install package was, not the not the restore backups. You're going to have to do a total reinstall if you if you lose that. Yeah, and and they they was initially reported through the media, um, and I'm sure several vendors that cover the region um, were aware of it um, because of um, the reports they were getting. So um, I think they were a little slow to respond to it because basically the symptom was black screen. Right. Why am I getting a black screen? Now my computer won't boot up. Um, You know, it's free able to reverse something like that is nearly impossible because of the fact that the master boot record, you know, what's essential for any Windows device to even start. Right, it's gone. Destroyed, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So um, when you go to do um, any kind of interviewing, to do some backtracking, to help discover um, what you're running against, you get user going, oh, I got a black screen. You're like, okay. Um, you know, right. and, and it makes it even more difficult. So uh, what you're hoping for is is, is a um, really well-designed, layered security defense system um, that can do packet capture and analysis, you know, heuristics detections, look for the behaviors, and then pull from the logging. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it's... it's uh, It's really scary in the sense that they also targeted um, ISP providers. Yeah. So So banks and telecom units uh, of South Korea mostly affected. Um, Mike, when we say state, from our previous episodes, if we say state-sponsored cyber 
terrorism. Who do you think of here? Well, one person, or one country, <laughs> That's China. That's right. Uh, so. and, and, and China was uh, initially uh, blamed for this, but uh, later was backtracked to North Korea. All yeah. North Korea? Yeah. So they, they in, in their analysis, they actually um, identified, uh, a, a, and I think it's more bragging, there was a telltale system, and it's in the notes, um, where somebody, I think, tried to identify themselves. Um, it's, uh, it's it's slipping me right now. I'm sorry. It's just been an extremely long day. But they did they did find um, there it is the who is team. Yep. So um, that somebody did basically try to leave a small signature behind. Mm -hmm. um, also um, that when they would overwrite the um, portion of the MBR um, within your disk space, um, it was basically two two words repeated over and over again to just basically crush just just it wiped out. it out. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, I, and you really got somebody plan this well. Um, it's one thing to go in and, and do that, but um, they completed the task. Most Windows um, changes don't apply until after a reboot. This had a forced reboot. Component. Right, right. Which what the shutdown shutdown minus R dash T zero was. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So T T zero is basically an immediate Re reboot now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and if you don't have a boot record, well. Things you ain't gonna boot. <laughs> yeah, black screen. So That's right. yeah, and because of the fact that the malware or or the attack um, forced a reboot, um, you know, users will get just basically black screen. Their right. computer will shut down and then black screen right away. So yep, say goodbye. Yeah. yeah, and and forensics on a blown master boot record. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the one thing you could do is is you could bring it up as another drive on another machine and get your data off of it, but it's never mm -hmm. going to boot again. So yeah. just say what you can and, and go forward. Right. At that point. Yeah. So have good backups. Uh, That's right. The lesson here. Backup. Yeah. Backup. Backup. Yeah. Now let let's talk about the reasons why uh, we ha really haven't talked about this. So we've talked about. Uh, China was looking for trade secrets. We talked about how Eastern Europe hackers are looking for credit cards and other personal data. So the North Koreans are really looking to wipe out your data and cause disruptive, uh, disruptive throughout the banking system and through the ISP. Uh, what, I mean, what's the danger here? Disrupt communications. Um, what people don't realize is, is Korea, South Korea is essentially um, smaller than the state of Ohio. So um, to target an ISP at a country of that size, you can cripple communications quickly. Um, and I got to say, I, it, this almost smells of, of someone testing, you know? What can I do? Initial How strike. Yeah, 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 preemptive, preemptive yeah. strike. See, uh, see what kind of reaction you get worldwide. All right. Mm -hmm. So, um, especially in the past, so because they were able to tie it to possibly North Korea activities mm -hmm. with the tension and and the current state um, of, you know, the change in politics and the change in scenery in Korea with the sun taking over, um, you would see this in the past where cyber criminals would destroy a drive to hide the fact that they stole data from you. Right. Right, cover the tracks. Yeah, this was just a straight up bomb. So yeah, um, you know, in other parts of the news, uh, North Korea is really sending out the threats, however they can, and so I guess it's a natural progression for them to go, oh, you know, I've got your banking system, and I don't care. I don't care. I don't right. want the data. I can delete it, I, and just to show you, I have access to it. That's right. And yeah. and would you say, Mike, that it's easier to wipe out data, destroy data, rather than steal data? Right. Well, yeah, it's real easy to wipe out data. I mean, it's, it doesn't take long at all to do that. So, um, again, and they don't think there's anything there they really want. You know, what's it? What's really matter? It's just, it's just basically at that point proving a point that we, you aren't safe. You know, we have, we own you basically at that yeah. point. And um, it was the Huffington Post that ran an article that um, that they believe that um, North Korea is putting millions, millions that they don't really have, into. Uh, mathematics and developing a team that can just sit there and do this all day long and test and test and test and probe. Uh, it's it's amazing that uh, that there are millions that are starving in North Korea, but yet they're pouring their resources into just destroying data. And uh, I assume that uh, Western countries will be the next target. So it's, it's an old school tactic um, that's being deployed on a new frontier. So um, one of the ways that you can disrupt any battlefield is disrupt communications. 
Um, leaders need um, essential information to make appropriate decisions to shift their resources to make the appropriate adjustments on a battlefield. And uh, I think this is going to be the third episode that we've discussed where you know there is a shift to now the cyberspace, you right? Know? Mm-hmm. The Cold War shift. Yeah, the, the shift. We always start to talk about wars, don't we? <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like we're always talking about some, some kind of war. So yeah. it's, it's basically someone taking um, a a founded um, tactic and just redeploying it to a new frontier. Um, you know, banking. You know, it speaks to how we say you can you can destabilize a country by destabilizing their economy. But the fact that um, there was um, ISP provider level support where you showed an attack at the provider level um, mm-hmm. shows an attempt to disrupt core communications because we are we're essentially digital. Right. So, um, you know, a lot of people forget that, you know, not to throw a brand name out there, but like a triple play where most people yeah. have IP phones. So all you do right. is take your, your provider yeah. out, and I've taken out your phone, I've taken out your internet, and I've taken out your news media because now you have no, no TV. Right. Disruption of communication at the core level. That's right. And we've seen through the storms like Sandy uh, that came through, um, you can just have all sorts of disruptions. If you know if you take out phones, if you take out banking, people can't get money and they can't make phone calls. That's uh, that's going to be right. a, a, a pretty horrible situation yeah when the money goes away that's that's where everybody starts getting hurt that's <laughs> yeah. right yeah so everybody relies on that so much and they're so electronic you just don't keep money around the house and things like that anymore that's so. right yeah um so to speak to the other end of it is is um as scary mm-hmm. as that as tack is and and i gotta say it's one of the um the articles that i, I just couldn't put down once i started reading um and it's it's uh the av vendors um semantic trend um AVG, other other vendors that are deployed to the region, did an excellent job of aggressively trying to um, break down this attack, to get a solution in place to protect their customers, um, and they still to this date say that um, you know they're providing an update so that we continue to analyze the data because um, I. I I got to imagine what they're basically doing is just having a lot of their customers pack up a hard drive and just send it to them. Because right. you black screen, like you said, you're, you're going to have to um, basically at that point. Recover data. Yeah, recover data and then start start working forward from there. And, and nobody has, has mentioned um, anything like a data stealer or an info stealer or financial targeting. And all the initial reports are um, somebody tested out basically a bomb, a cyber bomb. Yeah. So... But they've done a great job. Um, there are several signatures out there right now, um, you know, that are not only signature based but um, behavior on heuristic base to be able to one detect the file, and then two to be able to um, hopefully delete it and prevent it before it takes effect. Hey, this is a security dog, <laughs> Bella. Well, that'll be interesting because uh, we'll see who is getting the most detections here, Trend or Symantec. Both seem to be on the cutting edge here. And uh, luckily, they're getting their, their patterns out. And uh, so you might want to check your Trend blog and uh, Symantec to see how many of these are catching to see if uh, if that Korea space, you know, when they have the pie chart, if Korea doesn't explode here. And we'll, we'll know that if they're actually checking them. I, I got to say, it's got it's, – um, there are other things in the article that um, appear to be either coincidental or opportunistic um, defacement of, of websites of major corporations um, and then a couple other um, which appear to be um, what you would see on your, your typical um, just someone playing around yeah. um, as opposed to a malicious attack. Um, so the defacement of the websites were reported as being – very graphical video and sound yeah. not just somebody you know changing your words or altering an image yeah. but it was actually video upload to deface so because of what they saw with that versus the extreme bomb that they're seeing with you know the end users um they are a lot of the vendors are leaning towards that maybe somebody you know was taking advantage of a situation while you know ISP providers were crippled um, yeah. their focus was shifted so they're not too sure if this is you know directly related or if it just happened to be you know coincidental about the same time of the attack yeah 
somebody was taking you know advantage of the opportunity yeah more to come i bet you we talk about this uh in future episodes yeah, yeah. Okay. let's shift gears a little um and this article is from uh, isc how your web hosting account is getting hacked and i know john you uh you really like this article and in fact you did a little more research and you came up with a krebs article uh that came up with the uh, the genesis of a, a web attack as well and I, and I did, and it was really good. And actually, I wanted to try to um, bring Mike in on this because I know Mike does um, a lot with, um, you know, hosting. web hosting and, and sites. And then, um, but you you happen to use, you know, large providers. And, and the risk here is, is um, if you don't go with, like, the giants like GoDaddy and you happen to go with a, a smaller, more private um, web hosting, um, what they're saying is, is, is essentially is, is, is because um, these smaller companies may not have that much invested into their security, the um, exposure for um, the web hosting accounts, your accounts, your site, the server itself um, is at higher risk. And what they wanted to do is, is bring the awareness that, you know, why? And it's the tool, it's the server. Yeah, no, see, now my personal experience with this has been the opposite of that because um, all the ones like, uh, and this is the thing against you know, either Bluehost or GoDaddy or, um, or HostGator, but mm -hmm. all three of those I've had hacking incidents with. Um, personal, you've had personal. Yeah, personally yeah. I've had things like, that are hacked. And then the smaller mm -hmm. companies, I've never had that happen to me yet. Huh. And I don't know if it's because they're a bigger target. Right. Or if it's just the websites I put on them, you know, were more of a target. I don't know what's necessary. Right. Well, and part of the problem was a lot of it's WordPress. And yeah. um, with WordPress, that just can't recommend if you use WordPress. Just because that's every most every site I've ever attacked was a WordPress site. So yeah. just be careful with that. But yeah. um, I can see their point of being some of the small companies don't take uh, security as seriously. But typically, I have my own server. So I'm the one maintaining the security on the server, too. Right. So you have to do more work. Oh, yeah. Definitely, than... definitely more work. Yeah. yeah. But dealing with their help, I mean, they're generally really helpful, you know, to help you get things set but up. But they're saying they're very attractive targets because essentially they're super PCs. I mean, they're su servers. Yeah, absolutely. So um, they have the the basic um, exposure to the same vulnerabilities that a desktop would, um, depending on the components that you have installed to support your site. Um, but and then, not, and not just that, it's it's online all the time. So yes, it's, yeah. it's it's great for them to be able to to use to push out more of their malware, I yeah. mean. And they say because it's web hosting, it actually has um, more um, attack vectors because yeah, of the bandwidth you need to do web yeah. hosting. Um, it's the whole watering hole concept. The way you make the watering yeah. hole is you get in one of these servers and you put your stuff in there. And just quietly and, sit. Yeah, quietly sit and don't make any noise. So um, right. most of the things that, you know, users on, on a web hosting like you, like if you're gonna web host, you need to install um, a management console like cPanel. Right. Or, and, or Webman. Yeah, I've never had cPanel necessarily hacked. That I'm, well, that could have been how they got into it. I don't really know. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't generally run cPanel, but I don't have to. I run the Plesk or the higher level parallel stuff. I won't. I don't have no need for cPanel. So I don't, yeah. don't, if it's my own server, I don't really run cPanel. But the, the fact that a lot of those tend to be um, web management consoles. Yeah, absolutely. So, you have access to the whole machine at that point. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if they get into that, they have access to everything. Yeah. So yeah. which, which in increases the the uh, attack vector yeah, on, which, on a web server so you know you could you can patch your server itself but if you don't pay attention to the console right and somebody right. cracks your console you're like and, you, you know and i kind of wonder if that wasn't part of my problem before where um with bluehost and um hostgator i had cpanel yeah because i was on a, a, a shared server and well i could have one server at uh, a hostgator still that's not not cpanel but I'm wondering if maybe that's how they were getting in. Maybe that's where the hack was coming from, was through the cPanel or something like that. Yeah, right. Because I'd use a lot less of that on my own machines than. So, yeah. a, you know, it's not necessarily a scare tactic so much as it's a great informational article to let everybody know that, you know, you, you need to do an assessment. You need to know that you're going to have an increased risk, that you're going because of right. the increased exposure, because of the increased bandwidth, because of the additional consoles that you need to manage it. So um, when you decide to go with a smaller company um, or host yourself or even a large company, um, you need to think of, of um, what are my response plans going to be? In the end, you're responsible. 
um, unless you sign a, an agreement with somebody else that will monitor that for you. Right, and yeah. there are actually companies out there that will monitor your site for things. Yeah, it's like a site monitoring service. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I know a lot of the ISPs now, the big ones are are offering that as a service. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's not them doing it; it's another company. But basically, they scan your your website constantly for right. new stuff. Yeah. So, would they do their own pen testing? Is that what is that what they do? Um, well, I think what they're doing I don't is, really know. is checking for mm -hmm. changes. So they're yeah. um, we we actually have some of that set up where um, on the RSS feeds. So RSS feeds essentially look for changes to the actual web right. page to send you a feed. But so that doesn't that doesn't cover a hidden file. They wouldn't have put a oh, file yeah. in yeah. there, um, and it wasn't in the index so they could see it. Yeah, they'd be able to hide themselves. But they have to be doing something, either getting you know, directory level access to the command line or something to, to tell you what's changed. Maybe they go through FTP and do an yeah. An FTP file sort or something. Yeah. But it, and, and that type of environment, um, backups, 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 backups. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Any, any good ISP should back you up yeah. anyways. Yeah. But right. what you got to be careful of with them is sometimes if you go over this certain limit, they stop oh, backing you up. You. Number, uh, number of files or size of files. Right. Wow. They, and it'll tell you in, in the C panel or down there if yeah. it's being backed up or not. So right. that's something just to mm -hmm. keep an and eye on. And then the other, the other thing that this, that this should take into account is, is um, the accessibility of the host. So... Um, should you run into a critical or security situation, how accessible is your host going to be and how responsive are they going to be to your needs? Right. You know, things that you need to take into account. So, um, you know, if you think you're doing somebody a favor and trying to save them money and recommending them a smaller hosting site, um, sometimes you may lose more than you're saving. Right. Yeah. So what would you recommend to somebody who just wants to host one website? Do you, would you have... Have all the bells and whistles. How have HostGator offers different certain levels of services? Would you have them do more services, or would you have well, them do less services? It actually, it actually depends on how much traffic they're expecting, and do they want more than one domain? Things yeah. like that. But, um, I definitely recommend HostGator. They're probably one yeah. of my favorites. Well, for shared hostings, they're probably one I would recommend. For dedicated, like one one on one, or if you want to spend the money rack space. Rackspace is the number one, but they're rather expensive for most the average person. Yeah. Isn't Rackspace pushing towards cloud though? Um, they yeah, they, them cloud. and NASA developed the Open Cloud. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, from, I think it's a version of OpenStack. Right. Uh, which uh, you, I'm sure you guys you've heard of the OpenStack stuff. Yeah. So, um, but to answer your question, I would say, um, it really depends. If you want one domain, they can go to HostGator and you'd be fine with that. Um, what you got to be careful is if, if you're running something like WordPress, mm -hmm. they have the ability to keep it updated for you. Just make sure you're constantly checking that because yeah. if a, vulnerability, a vulnerability is found, they'll update it you know, pretty quickly. Right. So. Yeah. I've had good luck with HostGator, too. I've, I've always liked them, too. Yeah. And now, John, this is something that you pulled from Krebs, uh, the scrap value of a hacked PC. Yeah. So um, in the article, they, they basically um, wanted to you know talk about why web servers are, are so um, enticing for you know, cyber criminals to go after, but um, they also tie into an article that um, Krebs wrote last year that um, essentially says, you know, what's the true value of a hacked PC? And um, it was a great informational article. Um, I can tell you that I missed it last year, but while doing the research for the article, um, I found the link and I went into it and um, I just told Dennis, just, we really need to talk about this. And it, it is a great reference and, and it's it's basically the scrap value um, of a hacked PC and, and it goes to talk about um, how hacked PCs can be utilized, um, the different different ways that cyber criminals can utilize. And once they have access to your PC and, and users try to downplay it by saying, um, well, I'm you know, all I do is check email. I don't do online banking. I don't do anything like that. It's the fact that they have access on your PC um, that they can infiltrate every nook and cranny of your cyber identity life. Yeah. You know, they can leverage your box in attacks. They can leverage your box to sit and wait for, you know, you to eventually say, well, hey, I want to try this online banking, then they'll catch you. And and every piece of in information on a computer has been monetized. And I think you, you threw a number out there a couple of episodes back, um, basically that in a database somewhere, my information sits and somebody can yes. buy it. Yes, $5. $5, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> that, that amount was higher in the day. But, you know, oh yeah, yeah. It, but now it's just a, it's a, it's it's a commodity. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, right. But it, and, and he speaks to that Everything can be commoditized. Right. As as much as you, 
you know, think, well, I only got Hotmail just so I can keep touch with grandma, so I don't really need to worry about it. But <clears throat> think about it. That provides them access to your Hotmail or MSN Live, which provides them access to your contacts, which they can now attack your contacts. And if they infiltrate your contacts, they can monetize your contacts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, and it just right. keeps, it keeps, it keeps growing. Yeah. yeah. So, so, what were the visuals on this article, John? Did they have a, a spreadsheet they, they, or so kind they, of a... Uh, they had a great graph. So basically, yeah. essentially, it was an um, image of a PC. And off of the image of the PC had um, all the ways that a cyber criminal um, can utilize your hack PC and either additional attacks um, like DDoSs or in spam campaigns or to steal your data to get additional contacts to steal more data. And uh, he said that he recently um, updated this graph. So as new um, you know, attack vectors and as new malware and as new vulnerabilities come out that can further compromise someone's identity, he's added this to the graph. And um, it's pretty stunning. Um, it yeah. is, it's, you know, it's, I'm not talking, it's, it's an image of a computer with four blocks. It's the number of attacks that can be leveraged through one hack PC you know, it, it's basically double the size of the image of the computer. There's, and yeah. It's left and right side. Yeah. It, that's going to be in our show notes, and uh, I would definitely check that out. In fact, I'd like to see more of that. You know, what, what are the risks to each device? You know, sometimes computers are just, you know, too virtual to imagine what's in there. But, you know, if we put these in terms of old-style criminal, you know, what's the, uh, what's the web server? So is that the person who's just come back from the bank? And has their payroll in their pocket, and for the mugger, well, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a good day. That's a, a you know, a, a prime target. A good find. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. and I, I, um, they also say things like, you know, the information that they gather from you, um, they basically trade it, you know, like like stocks. Um, sometimes they might not get a a dollar amount, but it's still valuable. And another aspect of cyber cyber crimes that they say, well, I have this information, I can provide it to you. I need this service from you. So um, in the end, it's it whether they make actual cash off of it or they barter off of it, it's still going to benefit them in the end, and it's going to detriment you know any home user or PC. So um, you know, we're well beyond. Uh, just putting a antivirus scanner on your PC, right? Yeah. yeah. So and um, you know this this stuff, you know the entry may be low tech, but the end result is very high tech. Yeah, and it's always low tech yeah. with you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, LT. That's right. LT. That's right. I think we have a new nickname, and he is he is wearing giant blue. So, yeah. so. Uh, but those were great articles. Really, uh, I would suggest going to show notes and checking those out. Um, let's go ahead and reverse gears again here. Uh, a bug in EA's or origin game platform allows attackers to hijack players' PCs, and that comes from ARS uh, Technica. Uh, yeah, I was offended, Mike. Um, I mentioned it to John about EA, and he goes, well, Dennis, you do know what EA is. And I said, of course. I, Madden? I've played Madden before. And I, don't they play Pong? Don't they play Pong on these, <laughs> on these things? I'm, I, I'm not a gamer, it's true, but I do know what EA is. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I'm I, sorry. <laughs> I believe you're our resident gamer here. You probably want to go in first on this. What, what do you think about this? So... Console gaming is, is trying to bridge the gap between um, what's called an MMORPG, online gaming like World of Warcraft, um, where, you know, console gaming has is, is always been you versus the program. So now what they're trying is to do is... Is that what that is? <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're trying to bridge the gap and, and get um, things what's called PvP or player versus player, uh. where you can get an audience where um, it's unscripted. So... Um, you know, when you console game, after you die enough times, you know the tank's going to come from here. This guy's going to throw the grenade from there. And you can start to basically beat the game because you figured out the loop. But by doing an makes it Makes it less game, less predictable. Yes. Turns yeah. Right. yeah. So, and then what um, EA is also trying to do is follow, um, like, a Netflix model. So where you can actually launch games online, where you pay for service. Right, and that seems to be a new model for a bunch of people now. Steam. Steam, Steam well, Steam's, Steam's been over a long time, yeah. but um, so the, catching on. The exploit found with the Origins um, 
client and specific client base with the Origins client was actually vetted last year, October, when Steam got compromised. Yeah. Mm. So Steam got exploited, um, where users were going in and connecting through the online service and, and initiating or auto-launching a game that silently they were being infected. Um, so it's not new um, in the sense that nobody's ever seen it because it's been vetted already, but what somebody did was just basically said, well, let me try it against Origins because EA's Origins and Steam's platforms are direct competitors. Right. Um, so are you saying that it was a, a Steam person doing this? I don't think so much it was a Steam so much as someone says, well, if it worked on Steam, I wonder if it gotcha. works on EA. Okay. So you're not blaming them? No. So just want to make it clear. No, no, yeah. I just, yeah. <laughs> so I just, um, so it's it's not new in the sense in, in that nobody, like I said, no one's seen it, but it's actually been, it's been vetted right. already. Right, so they know it works on on a similar platform. Mm -hmm. Right, you know what I mean. So um, it's it's console gaming, but it it's online. Um, you know, and they can they can access the game and be able to play the game through this online network and paid service. Um, you know, and anytime you go online with this, you essentially have to um, establish open connections. You're opening right. Gateways. Well, yeah, and I mean, think about it, your machines be open for the game to play. Yeah. So just that alone. So right. the um, so this was brought out in um, an actual, um, I think it was a Black Hat conference in, in Amsterdam. And it was um, yes. demonstrated um, that the Origins platform, the client specifically, could be exploited. And, and um, they exploited it through the URI, um, which is essential for um, the Origin clients to, to run some of the games on their platform. And um, they had a game. They had an interface, they went through the origins, they launched the game, and then they showed how they could manipulate the interface and start to download malware while you were playing the game and had no idea that you were being infected. And so um, EA, uh, they took the information to EA. Um, they did their, their due diligence after they tested, they presented, and they said, hey, look what we found. And they went to EA and said, hey, we kind of found a flaw. You might want to address it. Um, I, this is where I, I almost think that EA made a mistake. So um, what EA did was downplay it. So um, EA... And that, 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 that never works. You yeah. don't want to try to downplay something or if you, until you're sure that it's, it's not as bad as what you think it is. So, yeah, because EA says yeah, that... It just comes it, back to bite you. Yeah, they mm -hmm. said that our team consistently investigates hypothetical. <laughs> so this isn't... I'm sorry, but... When you're at a black hat conference and someone just blew your <laughs> your vulnerability out into the public, yeah, yeah, that's something you don't want to say at a black hat conference. It's yeah. hypothetical because they're so, not going to they're right. going to prove it. Yeah, at, that's right. At the conference. Yeah, it'll be on so, YouTube shortly. Yeah, after. well, it, it, may, yeah. it could already be on YouTube. Yeah. You by now. Yeah. So. But they 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 say that they can continue to investigate and address issues like that to um, provide a a more secure product. Um, but the f the fact that Somebody had to say hypothetical. I mean, come on, really? It's, yeah. It's, you know, that's, they, that's the wrong thing to say. Somebody didn't go to Black Hat and said, I think you can do this, or what if we could do this? Someone went to Black Hat and went, look what I can do. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. And you don't want to stick your head up at Black Hat. That's right. <gasps> yeah. If you remain don't unnoticed at Black Hat, the better. Uh, don't yeah. take your yeah. phones. Uh, <laughs> <don't>, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and uh, this article is... Um, is pretty interesting, Mike. You, uh, I'm sure you have lots to add. We've been hearing about this that Apple adds two step verification to iCloud and Apple ID. Yeah, so um, I guess the question is have you guys gone out and gotten yours yet? Not yet. I no. definitely recommend you do. Okay. Um, it's And it's not a pain. It's just like you have to do it for everything. It only does it for like uh, account changes and things like that, high level stuff. Just buying an app on your phone, it won't ask you right. for your two-factor. So it's not as intrusive as some two-factors. Yeah. You don't have to have it you know, with you all the time to buy an app or something like that. It's only so, like when you're making account changes, password changes, stuff like right. that. Now, that would, is, it. so is it verification? Is it is it two passwords? Or what, what? what does it? It sends it to – it uses the um, Find My iPhone mm -hmm. uh, app to basically send you the code. Oh. So it puts the code on your phone. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, it, so actually – so like – and like you said, so it's it's right now it's, it's um, compartmentalized. Yeah, it's not like you know some things you you want a password or two factor for everything you do, mm -hmm. and it's not like that. It's not it's not that intrusive. So yeah. if it was, I wouldn't recommend you do it. Right. Um, but I mean, if you if you use the Google two factor, it's it's very similar. Yeah. Um, 
it actually is probably less intrusive than the Google one is even, I would think. Yeah. And the Google one's not that bad either. You set it up and you actually get it working, you don't really got to worry about it too much to you make you know account changes and stuff. Right. So it's like a cloud token code. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this next article uh, headline came from Krebs Security, and, I, you know, I have a lot of problems with this one. So, Privacy 101, Skype leaks your location. And what it is is that there are programs that you can add on to Skype, and it will pinpoint your IP and your location. You actually don't have to add anything to it. It'll tell you where is the it? person's what the person's IP address is, right. and then you just go to the um, the location IP database, and I feel you get, you get a general. You don't get an exact address, but right. you get a general. Yeah. So, now, this is why I find it hard to believe because, you know, Skype has a whole b- behind the magic curtain super node, you know, where you can, you know, where it will go out to connect to these super nodes. And how can you get back to an IP like that, a, you know, a specific location? I can see the, so the general found, location. Yeah, what they found was was, was um, in the background that Skype was um, logging the information. So basically what it does logging is... Logging the yeah, information. It was, it was tying yeah. your account to your IP. Yep. It wasn't your, your connection to the super node. So, but, you know, that, but that that kind of makes sense because they have to have logs probably for legal reasons. I that's think. right. Mm-hmm. So they're going to log where you connect from. But, I, I mean, me just being an, an operator would want to know that. Yeah. So, uh, but the the thing was, is it was plain text unencrypted. So you didn't need any kind of elevated privileges to go into it to be able to do that. So they said all you need. But that's on the Skype was, servers, though. Yeah. They they essentially yeah. said all you really needed was um the username. And then there was a method. It wasn't for the general public. It was for them. No, they said they they said if you went out on the article and if you Googled for um their within the article they tell you which tools there are several free ones out there and they walk you right through it. But yeah, those are installed on the Skype on, you know, on the Skype directly. Yeah. So you don't right. have to go to the Skype server. I mean, all that's doing is showing you their remote IP address, which is actually already there. Just yeah. it's hard to get to. Yeah. So the tools have made it easy to get to basically. Yeah, and that's what it did. So and it made it a little more accessible. So um, it can allow for. Um, you know, essentially, um, either harassing somebody, um, or what um, Krebs um, and uh, AR was it ARC? Yes, ARC. Yep. Um, what they said was they found was um, that uh, they were able to utilize um, a similar method to get their IP to basically send a DDoS targeted attack, and they well, mentioned yeah, it in yeah. the article that they were DOSed. Right. So. The super dog wants that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The super dog wants some attention. I think uh, we might have to do a little more on Skype, or maybe that's a good one for uh, yeah. And you know, we use we use Skype, you know, yeah. a lot here yeah. actually. Mm-hmm. You so know, the, the night we did the thing together, but that's right. yeah. I use it for other shows, you know, a lot more. Right. Um, like tomorrow night show, I actually use it to talk to people and to talk to us. Right. You know, it works. Yeah. So they said that this is this is actually a um, very old vulnerability that um. Prior to Microsoft purchasing Skype, yeah. um, existed, and when Microsoft purchased Skype, um, they were hoping, you know, here we got a little bit deeper pocket. Maybe they can do something to remedy this to help provide better privacy, and it's a privacy issue. Um, Microsoft says, well, we're, you know, we're aware of it, and we'll yeah, kind of you know, but if you think about it, the average person wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah, that's right. It's the people that aren't the average. That's right. That are the ones yeah. you want to stay away from it. Mm-hmm. And the average person wouldn't care, for that matter. That's right. Because your IP is just a number somewhere. The fact <laughs> that they can figure out you live in Frederick, Maryland, or wherever. Right. Yep. I mean, what, are you going to get a phone book out and try to find the person? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And so this is a concern for me. You know, for my children are always using Skype. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. You know, I'm but concerned. But beyond that, it gets, it gets more sensitive when your kids are using your phone that's storing where the picture was taken from. Yeah. So that gives you an exact position where your house is, or you post on Facebook and you don't have the location services turned off. That's right. You know, that's more invasive, I think, than the IP address is. Where it comes down is if you're somebody who is easily attacked for something. I know we're going to talk about the Krebs thing a little later about his attack yep. that yep. he had. But, you know, that's a good way to find out what his IP address was. If you're talking to somebody, is you know, through Skype, if you're trying they, to attack them. That's right. They were trying to really drive the – it was a more of a privacy um, issue and, and uh, um, you know, if – if you really want to get people to buy on board, you try to get really loud. Right. With it. Yeah. I and, mean, um, it, as far as privacy issues go, I think this is one of the lower ones, in my, yeah, in my opinion. That's true. There's a lot of them that are a lot worse. Because they, they went into, um, and they, they painted a couple scenarios, of course, to try to, to really hype it up that, um, you know, somebody who is savvy with this, and like you said, not your average user, yeah. somebody who's savvy who is like this, um, if somebody 
you know, they knew was very active on Skype but traveled a lot, that they would actually be able to track their destinations. Yeah, well, and the other thing they could do is tell they're not at home. Yeah. So I think that would be that'd be more of my concern is people know you're traveling and you're not at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, on the, the low totem pole here, uh, if you really want to know where somebody lives or any know anything about them or any. Thing like that, I think hacking a Facebook account is more effective. More effective, yeah. Or just download one of their photos and see if they didn't turn off location services on their phone. That's what I say. It's right. my, my thing is you wouldn't really need to hack a Facebook no. account so yeah. much to say, "Hey, be my friend." Yeah, yeah. And, and then save the picture. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next article comes from Sans, um, and we've talked about this before in previous shows. Wipe the drive, stealthy malware persistence. It's part four. We talked about part. Two, I believe, and that was a great article. I recommend checking this out. But here is the same article. Okay, you've got, you know, you have malware. Wipe the drive. Just go. Just wipe the drive. Don't even worry about it. What, and what, what's our opinion on that? I think we all agreed last time. Just wipe the drive. Just wipe the drive. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could talk for days on that. Yeah. So the, yeah, no, you, you and I disagree <laughs> on that one. Yeah. I really I, I'm not even spending that much time <laughs> figuring out what's so they, on. But they, yeah. they, what they do is, is um, you know. Instead of doing the shock and awe, they, they broke it out in parts. Yeah. You know, so they, they let you make that decision. So they um they provided additional information for you to be able to make a good decision. The information that discussed in part four was um what we have seen as a shutdown beacon. Um essentially um it's going to um execute a DLL at log off, at shutdown. So um and it talks about um the reg hacks. How do I identify the reg hacks? How do I identify the file? Um, if that's not a poor part of your normal image, then of course you should extract the file and then reverse it and see. Um, but we have seen um, uh, shutdown or log off beacons um, on our network because basically what it does is it, it talks out and tells somebody, hey, they're about to change networks. Um, and if they know what your um, like your corporate network is versus your home network, they're gonna know that you're probably sitting on a more vulnerable network when you're at your home. So if they see a shutdown beacon and they identify that to be your corporate office, so they're not gonna try anything, um, and if they're watching for you and they see you come back online and they identify you're now at home. Right. So so they, they talk about log off or shutdown beacons and how they work and how to identify one and then what you should do to take the steps. And then of course they go, Wipe it. Yeah. Now, I'm leaving early, so uh, you guys will be on your own. I wanted to skip down to a couple of articles and talk about those real quick. Sure, go ahead. The first article is Cisco switches to weaker hashing scheme, passwords cracked wide open. And that's from ARS uh, Technica again. I re really love this article uh, because Cisco had a problem when it installed its software and it didn't salt its passwords. Yeah, and it's... It doesn't salt. I don't think it's – well, I think the new versions do. Yeah. Type 5. Well, it yeah. was type, supposed type to. Type 5s. It was yeah. supposed right. to. It just didn't when it installed. Right, yeah. right. So, I mean, there's always been a bunch of tools out there to um, help crack uh, Cisco passwords. Yeah. So, I mean, it's getting harder with the Type 5 passwords are a little bit harder to Well, don't you to just crack. go to the website and go see the master Cisco passwords? Isn't that <laughs> yeah. one well, way to do it? <laughs> that, that, hopefully, that isn't the case, but, yes, that does happen. That happens. Yes. Yeah. That happens. <laughs> So. Yeah, and another reason to always change those master passwords. Any device that you have, the any switching device that you have, always yeah, changes. Yeah, and, and beyond the master password, change your default. It's an MP string. Always well. change the default. And, you know, I believe that uh, we have seen studies where people don't change the default for whatever reason, or they go back and they reload the uh, the, the default settings. Right, they don't they don't fix it. Don't fix the password. It's always interesting when you go into a site and you start to scan the rest of MP for public, how many things are around or respond right? to yeah. and tell you what they, what they are and all right. that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, and the I mean, the, if he gets great awareness, um, and it provides you with enough background information um, that you can formulate a scan, yeah, and then check your network for whether or not you upgraded to the Type Five or whether you still have a, an existing systems at Type Four, and then do your risk assessment from there and say, right. hey, we are on Type Four. You know, we're publicly facing. We have right. a higher, you know. Yep. Yeah, uh, so it, it just just a Cisco it, it should be the number one security company, and they do a great job. But this can happen to. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I like Cisco, yeah. but their security products. I mean, they're they're definitely That's getting true. better. Yeah, I remember like the first Pixes and stuff that were out. They were just 
really, really bad. So. Right. Yeah, but there's, I mean, you know, it, it's just like any lock on any door or, or any other security appliance. Somebody's, it, they're only there to keep the honest people out. Someone's going to eventually figure them out. If they want to get in, they're going to get in. Well, they, they figured it out. Yeah. And they said, uh, Cisco, yeah. oh, yeah, here. And, and at least they're being open about it because, you know, could, right. they, they could hide it and say and just under their covers. So they're telling everybody if you have fours, go to fives. That's right. And yeah. things like that. So, yeah. And, and that's good in the sense that they, it just shows that um, they're trying to be proactive. Right, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as we talked about that, better to get it out, let everybody know, yeah. and yeah. then be surprised by it, or know it and keep it a secret, and and then have a have yeah, a hack. These days, you don't keep things a secret for very long. Yeah, so. that's right. No. And all doesn't hurt you in the long run. Everything is very fast these days. That's and, right. You know, you come from. You know, we talked about the black hat. Well, it's going to be on YouTube that day. Right. You know that they come up with something. Yeah. While they're sitting on the floor in the conference center, they're they're putting it on YouTube when they're done. Right. So mm-hmm. I mean, it's just like the the Yahoo exploit that we talked on last episode the the person that actually um found the cross-site scripting exploit learned how to leverage it youtube did and then posted it and then invited everybody to go download a tool and give it a try hey. that's right yeah so yeah i mean it's i gotta say if if um i'm trying to learn something um if i don't ask mr google i ask mr youtube yeah that's yeah, right. One or the other. Right? <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's amazing. I don't know if YouTube was ever meant to be a teaching tool, uh, but it sure has become that. I learned all sorts of stuff. I, I had a neighbor who um, who couldn't get her key out of her minivan, and she asked me to come over because we had the same minivan, and I couldn't get it to, to get out either. You know, it was the, it was almost like the wheel was stuck. I go on YouTube, and it says, "Oh, you have to." Turn, turn the key while you're turning the the wheel at the same time. It's as simple as that. But it was right on YouTube and it had a, a pretty good explanation. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so the the uh, the next article uh, is kind of in the same vein. What's right and what's wrong? You know, is it right to tell about a vulnerability that you discover? It's in the same vein. So here's the headline: Gorilla researcher created Epic Botnet to scan billions of IP addresses. Uh, and this again comes from ARS Technica. And this is what the researcher did. Unnamed researcher scanned the internet for IP addresses. I don't think he's unnamed anymore. I think he's been arrested. Is, is that right? I think so. <laughs> then, then they definitely would have his name. Is that right? Because the article, uh, which came out on the 27th uh, today, didn't name him. And, oh, that makes it that's a different article. Because somebody else did something very similar to that. Yeah. They, they went in, basically scanned the whole internet. Yeah, scanned, scanned the whole internet. Yeah. And, uh, is that the one that has the maps, nice pretty maps and, and colors everywhere? It, it didn't say that. It says, unknown hacker developed a small scanning program. Yeah, I'll have to take a look at it. I mean, I, I don't I Yeah, You know, I do. I think that's another article, actually. Okay, because yeah. the guy who did the nice pretty pictures and everything was arrested. Yeah, wow. And basically told everybody that he wants, he wants the maximum penalty. I don't know why you do that, but he told everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he did a Reddit AMA the day before, and they used yeah. some of that. Yeah, I trial. think that is another article. So okay. th- this was a researcher who did it for researching purposes. Well, which the other guy did, too. He's just is trying to right? prove. He's yeah. To prove a point. Yeah. But, so what he did was he herded uh, he herded 420,000 internet connected devices into his botnet group. Now, he uh, he put some safety measures in so if it affected the PC it it would dump out. But really he uh, he scanned the whole network and the 420,000 are ones where he found passwords that he could get in either root or you know if it was a, a the nobody nobody p- password anything like that. And that's 420,000. Now, I imagine that a good portion of these were printers because nobody locks down a printer. Right. Nobody thinks about locking down Nobody a thinks about so locking it. So it's one of those things you don't even think about. Yeah. It just prints. What else? Why would lock it well, down? I mean, that's but, right. uh, what if people don't realize is that printers are getting more and more complex and they actually have FTP protocols installed on them. Of course they do. And they have operating systems. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard to tell what kind of operating system it is these days. Could, all, you, all you need is that one hole into the network. And if it's a printer, uh, once you're in, you're it's in. A, yeah, it's a jump point. Right. And it does have a network card. So if you wanted to launch a uh, DDoS attack, you could do it. You could right. do it because it's going to ping out. And we know that uh, printers can get awfully chatty when when yeah. when they have problems and issues. I mean, but, it's, you know, there's there's things like that going on. And, and um, you know, there's there's always an ethical issue. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I got to say, um, I, think, I think it's ethics kind of gets thrown out of the window when you see the end results. Um, he was very open about it. He discussed that it was research. He obviously didn't use it in any type of malicious, you know, attack or or exploits. He didn't steal data. He put safety, a lot of safety measures in place. 
Um, so when somebody says, well, how ethical is it? Well, if I do that and then I botnet somebody and then use them in a DDoS or rent it out, then yeah, of course that's not ethical and that's criminal. But if you do it to uh, you know, provide additional information that may further the field, then... I still yeah. think it probably falls into the illegal activity under some kind of communication. So you you think that this is a criminal activity? Well, I don't think he meant it to be criminal, but I yeah. think it could be. Con- but but intent criminal. intent is not always uh, the basis no, no, for, for criminal law. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I thought that was very interesting. You know, um, for one, you know, you would really want to break down these four hundred twenty thousand and see what they are. I think printers. Well, you know. Printer companies could do more on protecting their products and pe- having people password, without a doubt. But um, it's less information, less harmful to hack a printer than it is a PC. Yeah, and, oh, and yeah. the other thing is, is, is um, you know, you you try to you try to put a concept around the size of the internet. And it's, I mean, to me, I, it's it's almost mind blowing. Un- yeah, unfathomable. Yeah. And yeah. the fact that he got that number is is, is a snapshot in time. Yeah, that it, is. What it it was, wasn't a very long yeah, time period either. That, right. that yeah. was on, you know, at that time that he happened to be doing his research. Um, so imagine if somebody was doing this continuously, what that number would be. Right. Yeah. The other number I imagine that's pretty high and at four hundred twenty thousand. Uh, I bet you there were some free Linux products that were in there where people did, as we just talked about, didn't change the root password. Yeah. I would guarantee you because when you download Ubuntu or the other free Linux, hardly anybody changes that, thinks to change the root password well, on it. In, you know what? And it's even more so now with Ubuntu because you don't log into root and you sudo your own That's commands. right. Yeah. That's right. So you never even the think root of... to change the password on root. That's right. You never even think about root at that yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. However, I do think Ubuntu protects you from logging in as root now. Yeah. Um, I think you have to th- do the sudo. But still, it's one other weak link that somebody could find a hole to get in, you know. So. That's right. And as we all know, they distributed those CDs all over the place. They were they were all over to get their name out there. And people are probably still using them. And, uh, you know, I bet you the root password is still in there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know you, you still download it today. You want to, you're going to get your default root password. That's right, yeah. You know, first thing you should do is go into sudo to root and change the change password. Change that password, yeah. You know, people don't even, I mean, you want to focus target market is people that aren't very computer savvy because it's touted to be That's a right. free easy to use unix and then nobody, nobody thinks about you know going in and changing um changing all that stuff so. that's right. and that's what it, and it always falls back to is is um convenience you know what i mean right Con- convenience always opens the additional risks well it's convenience and education i think that's right the case Mm -hmm. we want to you know that's a a theme that we have tonight and they aren't the only ones that do that you want to isn't the only one that's right popular linux does it too you know all those i know all the all the the free ones usually do just to keep it simple for everybody exactly that's the second time we've said convenience versus security we talked about gator which a product that we love um and i found it very easy to use uh but you get a little complacent you know you say well here you know i it was so easy to do you know but you got to check that cpa Panel. That's right. Yeah. I think I have time for one more. Uh, Microsoft confirms compromise of high-profile Xbox Live accounts. Again, from ARS uh, Technica. Now, John, what is this Xbox uh, that we speak of? What what kind of box is this again? <laughs> I think it's another console game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and just to make this clear, it was Microsoft's employees who were playing Xbox Probably at the headquarters at Redmond, uh, probably, or at home, or wherever they are. Playing uh, or testing? Uh, playing, I got the impression that they were high-profile users. That's what I got the um, hmm. out of that. How, how do you distinguish between playing and working and yeah, job it, like it, that? High, it says, high, take over high-profile Xbox Live accounts. So maybe you're right. Maybe it was a combination of people who test or, you know, or yeah. their Microsoft employees. I'm not sure. So, it, I mean... But they were able to get the access to not only get current but former employee information. Yeah, former Microsoft employees. So, and then and that just goes to speak to the progression of technology. Um, console games aren't your Ataris. No. You know, it's not just read a chip and spit it out. They're, they're hard drives with motherboards. They're PCs. You yeah, know? they're basically a PC yeah. in a little box. You know, except yeah. for you've got a 60-inch monitor sitting in your living room that's coming yeah. off of it. I mean, you can you can connect to the internet, you can stream movies to it, you can do, you know, Steam or Xbox Live, or you can do Origins platform, you know, they, it just, the only thing I think it, it is really missing is, is a QWERTY keyboard. Right. And then you have the, the new ones coming out, like the OUYA coming out. That yeah. is, you know, it's, 
um, Android based. Yeah. So it's you know, the same Android hacks we already have for Android can oh, be yeah. then applied on the the Ouya or right. how do you say it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Right onto the console. Yep. Well, I'll leave you with one uh, thought here. Uh, on we had we talked about EA and then we talked about Xbox. Isn't getting hacked part of the gaming experience? Isn't it part of the game? Well, they, you know, I, I mean, we what are. Game are you playing? Well, <laughs> you know, think about it. You know, we have online games. Isn't this just another game within a game? I mean, it can. I, mm-hmm. But I think that that's something that's left over from late '80s, early '90s, and I think the movie was called Hackers. Angelina Jolie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So I thought you I was thinking you meant like uh, what was the original one with the three hundred baud modem? <laughs> war games. Yeah, war games. Yeah. So yeah. you know where um, that's where they introduced an, an environment of you know young um, either kids, high school kids, or young college kids, you know playing video games, free will, having fun, but then they had this expertise. Hacking ability, you know, really high level computer knowledge, you know, not only to hack computers, but the telephone system. So they, they started to, freaking, that's what yeah. they always call it, freaking. Yeah. yeah. So they, yeah. they started to um, paint this image. So, um, and it's sad to say we're, we're gamers and hackers are almost seen in the same crowds. Right. So, yeah. Uh, I'll turn it over to you guys, and you'll probably want to take off at Apple ID uh, or uh, Apple Suspends Password Resets after critical account hijack bug is found, again, from ARS Technica. Right. Then that's another reason why you want to do the two-factor, because that gets you past that, that issue. So, Will you be careful and have a good night, Dennis? Yep. So, um, I mean, Apple seems to be really proactive, uh, especially with um, them moving aggressively against Java, putting the onus back against Java, um, then doing the two-step um, verification, um, and now they're suspending password resets after a critical account hijack bug is found. So um, I gotta say, you know, it's that's a great job by by uh, Apple to quickly. Ad- one identify and two address and then right. get, then get ahead of right and you know, the other thing we didn't mention before um, it was the um, the two factor is only available in certain countries right now okay. I think it's like five countries U S Canada U K Australia maybe and something else Sweden maybe something like that I don't know why that is but it's not available okay I was, I was gonna ask if it was a limitation of the resources or if it was I don't know what the reasoning is behind it but yeah it's I, I know in, in our work we we run into um, multiple different layers of security because of um, different countries on their privacy laws different countries on you know their um, access and their platforms and tools that they allow and and we have to kind of adjust to um, make sure you maintain the integrity of the network but respect the countries. So I almost wonder if maybe they're running into that a little bit. Yeah, I don't know what the reasoning behind that necessarily yeah. is. There's a lot of weird laws that came out this year. Um, I know one just started, maybe today or yesterday, where um, you can't you can't store in the European Union. Yep. You have to ask before you can store cookies, cookies on a machine now. Oh. So, so if you go to a website in the UK, it'll ask you, or do you allow us to save? And like the one side I went so to third to, party cookies, third party cookies, yeah. yeah. So that's something that's new that just started. So that's pretty good. And and I know um, one of the issues back on um, related to Skype um, that Skype is actually running into an issue um, in the European countries because of the fact that um, they consider them. Um, as telecommunications or a form of of, um, electronic communications. So um, European countries are allowed access to that type of information. And, you know, Microsoft and Skype says, well, that's not what our primary delivery is. That's not our primary focus. So, no, we don't consider ourselves as electronic or or digital communications in that sense. So um, they're denying certain countries access, and and right now they're at war about it. And so... um, and, and you know you just got to say when you see a limited distribution so are they testing it just to see the effectiveness or or is it a sizing thing you yeah don't you still know maybe just a all. rollout maybe yeah yeah they don't want to take too many things on at one time maybe yep all right so um so since we're in the mobile phone uh discussion here on apple and mobile phones um we want to talk about a little bit about ting one of our sponsors have you ever heard of ting I've never heard of Ting. So I hadn't heard about it recently either. And, you know, and Ting is really cool because um, have you heard that uh, T-Mobile is going to start doing no contracts now? 
No. Oh, so they're going to do is the buy as you go. Yeah, yeah. So that's what Ting is, but Ting uses Sprint. But Ting's been around a lot longer. You know who Two Cows is, right? Who? Two Cows? Yeah. Okay, so that's who runs this. So um, okay. they also do uh, like Hover and stuff like that. And uh, basically, uh, Ting allows you to go in and has all these neat little things, but it's all based on what you use, and it's family-based. And if you come in and you say your family uses no more than 500 minutes and only 100 text messages a month, uh, what, 500 megabytes maybe? So it actually bills you on your actual usage. Right, and they don't, if you don't usage. use it, they give you the money back in the next in your next bill. Well, that's good. Yeah. I, I would almost um, – and that's and that's actually really good. Because it's really neat. Yeah, I mean, because everybody else forces you to sign these contracts on, on predictive usage. You yeah. Know, do you think you'll use this much? And you know, then they'll they'll tell you you don't want to go over because if you go over, you know, your charges go to here. I, I've, I've gone over before, and if you go over, it just takes you to the next level. It yep. doesn't charge you a, a fine, but I'm calling it a fine. Yeah. Because that's basically what I had. It wouldn't happen to me. But they're using the Sprint network, so they have really good coverage everywhere. Um, they are Android friendly, but lots of really cool devices. Um, and you send them your devices, so you basically buy them, and there's no contract. So you can quit and start up anytime you want. There's no contract for. You buy the phone, it's yours. You're going to leave in a month. You leave in a month. So, so. when you when you do these, and and um, you got to forgive me because I'm not too mobile savvy. When you do things like Ting, and you do as a, a pay as you go, um, do they offer middleware that allows you to at least back your data up onto your devices? Because I mean, if you well, sign, yeah, it's your it's your phone. You can pretty much back it up as you would your iPhone or your or yeah. your um, your Android phone. You they know, got a cool savings calculator. Here. It's really neat. And they're a sponsor now, and uh, they actually gave us. Uh, a code for twenty five dollars off of your first bill or your phone, and it's just uh, techzen.tv slash ting. And when you go to that link, it'll give you twenty five dollars off. For... That's great. I mean, that's that's honestly, that's I I think you know, and it takes innovators like this to um, you know step up and say um, we're not gonna one bind you to a contract, two we're not going to make you pay for something that you're not necessarily gonna use, and then you know right charge you on what you actually do and and I think that's and that's great and like you said it's no penalties if you just slip into the next category then it's the next segment of building billing and they have all the billing advertised on the site so you know what you can almost expect right. and and family usage adjusts so like right now my daughter's very young but as she gets older then you know here comes we may need to add another phone so I'll have an increase in data usage I'll have an increase in texting you know, I'll have an increase in, in minutes. So instead of me going to a, a major provider and saying, I have to adjust my family plan, Ting just says, well, we saw an increase. All right, and so they, they, they make adjustment the for it. Yeah. And the other thing is it's only $6 a month per device. So you can put for $6 for each device, and that the rest of the time is, is shared. So if you want to put a phone, like in the glove box of your grandmother's car because she doesn't use a cell phone, but you want her to have a phone case she ever needs it, just you there. can 6 bucks. It's like yeah. in the glove box. Now there's your emergency phone. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, they have another weird thing that's um, uh, interesting is they have a no hold policy between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. If you call, you will never be put on hold, and you don't talk to a machine ever. So if nobody's available to answer, it'll keep ringing. They, but they say they pick it up real fast. But if you're on the phone, they don't have to put you on hold. They don't have to go to the supervisor. They can do everything for you without getting any kind of approval. Right, which is a good return to a focus on customer service because I think a lot of people, um, you know, companies, they, they took it for granted. You need us, you know. right. So and and it's good it's a good focus back towards the customer to have that kind of personal customer service. Yep, and like I said you can cancel anytime. It's really neat. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yep. I gotta go look it up. All right, back to the news. <laughs> so one of the one of the other articles um, that we pulled online from um, a site called incompleteness.me was um, that JSON. Is not as safe as people think it is. It's not. So, uh, Mike, with your, I, I, your coding I background, I, I agree with that. I mean, it's very the thing about JSON is it's so easy and so flexible that people don't realize that it's not as protected. You know, I mean, there's things you can do to make it better, but there's no authentication. It's basically a flat file coming down. So, yeah, I agree. Definitely not is a. Yeah, they're saying that um, there are basically two essential um, reported problems. One called CFRS or cross-site request forgery. That can be leveraged yeah, through yeah. JSON. There's like I said, there's no authentication, so it's easy to do. Yeah, so it lets it lets people essentially bypass the cookie authentication. Right. I mean, you can do some things that build it in your own, but by default, it doesn't have any any of those things built into it. So um, that's why you don't typically see it like on on the SOA interfaces, the yep. service stuff. 
uh, because it's unauthenticated. It's just not as not as safe as XML, and so. So, um, but it's it just goes on to um, a lot of people. Um, they're uh, assuming that JSON was considerably more secure than than what you should believe it. And so, I mean, it's it's not somebody trying to take down JSON. I think it's just more of an awareness item. Right. Yep. Um, absolutely. So, you know, to to maybe do a little more research. And then um, make sure that you're appropriately protecting yourself, your data, and your sites. Yeah, it, it it can be protected, but by default it's not. And as long as you're aware of that, I think you you're you're good to go. And just it's just more of an awareness thing than anything else. Yep. So and so and I and it just you you got to say with you know things like Java and Adobe, you know those guys are on parade right now in the media that you know things like JSON can can slide by you. And, yep. you know, and it's, you know, it's, you know, we need the articles like this. And, and yeah. And one of the things about JSON is that if you're doing stuff in JavaScript or uh, in Java, it's so easy because it's done in that same format. It just comes right in. So that's why it's so popular. Yeah. As well. And it's, and it's a pretty lightweight platform. It's right? very, oh yeah. All this is a download protocol. So yeah, yeah it's pretty, very lightweight. So, um, in the slate.com, the FBI wants, um, real time Gmail, Dropbox, and spying power. So, um, what do you spying power? <laughs> so, uh, what do you what do you what I are your thoughts have on that? Some pretty well. I I it's it comes down to a, the personal protection. I mean, I don't know how they can actually do that uh, without uh, getting um, a warrant. I mean, I don't want my data. Not that I'm really hiding anything, but. I just don't want everybody going to be able to go in there and look at it real time without get it going through the warrant process first. I think it needs to be that helps justify the reason that they're going and getting the data. I yep. Think. And and um in our in my CCFE course um, when we were going through CCFE and 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 actually they address this on the test and you actually have to be savvy on it. Um, data in transit um, is covered by the wiretap law. Right, right. Yeah. So, so what, what they're asking for in here is you get to go past all that stuff, though. Yeah, and they're and and I, you know, we in the security field will always try to push the issue and say, you know, we're just trying to secure you, we're just trying to protect you, we're just trying to secure you, we're just trying to protect you. But um, I I honestly think that sometimes people abuse that. Right. And um. When, you know, somebody does abuse that kind of authority and somebody continually starts to say that um, it's detrimental not to just the FBI, but it's detrimental to the entire security industry and it makes it more difficult for us to accomplish our job. And um, I just, you know, you want to understand, you want to have empathy towards their plight, you want to try to understand their mission, but at the same time... You know, yeah, I think if there's no control, it gets out of control, and that's what I'm trying to say. Is I think it, uh, and if you go through the process where you have some control by, by actually going out and, get, and getting subpoenas, somebody's double checking them. They're just not randomly going out and picking stuff. Yeah, and you know, it makes a judge say, "Do you really need this? Or is there enough evidence that you need to get in?" So yeah, and I, I would understand if it was case by case to get the real time, um, and I, I just still think that, um, you know, you, you need that. That self checking, mm -hmm. right? Um, as long as they they leave that self checking measure in there, um, you know, then by all means go forward with it. But um, I, you know, unlimited carte blanche, right? Do what you want. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's you know necessary. It's a whole privacy thing. I don't think it's yeah. it's not not right. So and then now. Uh, we, we well, we discussed the Cisco switches. We yeah, we discussed the Cisco switches. So the There's type. one thing up here that I wanted to kind of go over. I thought it was an interesting article. No, no. Well, actually, there was two things. Um, the one with uh, Krebs. Where is that one at? So we have a. Um, there's the rails. Oh, yeah, here it is. No, I'm knocking the next level. A cyber attack uh, spills into the real world. Uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, and this was actually. Um, it's an interesting article, but do you do you go through and read that one? I didn't catch that one. So what it is is, uh, you know who Brian Krebs is, right? Yes, I know. So he was the target, and they somebody what they call it uh, swatting him. <laughs> so they were doing a DOS attack on him on his website, and uh, they got threatening letters, uh, supposedly from the FBI, which wasn't the FBI, uh, to the company that does his DOS protection, 
So they sent it to him. He confirmed the FBI. It wasn't them. Uh, he had a dinner party going on and upstairs. His phone was ringing. And then dinner party's over and he saw something outside his door and he goes to pick it up. And as he's leaning down to pick it up, he hears this freeze hands in the air and there's whole SWAT team around him. And somebody had called in the SWAT team. <laughs> so, um, and the funny thing is he had heard of this swatting thing and he'd actually sent uh, a letter or something to his legal local police department saying that this is going on. And uh, actually the, the one, I guess their ma- whatever the police officer, the manager, whatever it is, comes and he goes, are you the one that sent us the letter about this swatting stuff? And he goes, yeah. He goes, okay, take his cuffs off. Because it was, they just happened, and they said it's a big thing on the West Coast right now. Though is somebody will call, and then he said, they they said that somebody called, said that some Russian people broke into my house, and they had my wife tied up, and that's what the SWAT team came out. Ah, so it's essentially the new bomb threat. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly what it is. It's a bomb threat. He said this is more dangerous though because they had him at gunpoint. They could have shot him thinking he was going for a gun or something. Right, like as that. I say, the police are going in there thinking that yeah. you know one there's. There's a threatening situation, you know, not only if they are at risk, but somebody at the site is at risk. So they're going to be on high alert. They're going to have a lot of adrenaline. And like you said, he, they might have seen the glimmer off the wine glass, but not seen a wine glass. You know? Right. So he basically got attacked from cyber and from <laughs> and from non-cyber. Yeah. So both. So hey, And that was... That's, and it's Brian, kinda... it's Brian Krebs. He's a, he's a pretty high profile. He is. I mean, so, I mean that his... was why he, he was a target, I'm sure. But then I, apparently, I can't remember who the... Was it Ars Technica he was talking to, or somebody else he was talking to? Did an interview with him the night the night after that. They were they were DOS also. They they followed him. Yeah, whoever yeah. did the article, uh, because he called out some people. He uh, Brian Krebs did some research and actually called out some people. Yep. So on the research on one of the earlier articles on um you know the web hosting and why it's such a rich target and what your PC is is worth and when I was going through and doing the research on that, um I I picked up on. He says, I got DDoS. He that says was, that yeah. ARS got DDoS. Yeah, ARS technically got DDoS too. Yeah. yeah, that's what it was. So, and and he he talks a Groden little bit about it. Groden so I saw Groden it. is his name. Um, I, can't, I can't remember. Yeah, Groden's the guy at ARS Technica. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, he um, he's pretty open to talk about it. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, the, you know, what's sad is, is somebody went after Krebs when essentially he's he's – a excellent resource. He's information. You know, he right. he doesn't come out and say, "I'm in the security industry." What people don't realize is is that Krebs actually cut his teeth at the Washington Post. Right. He's a reporter. Right. He actually lives in this area. So yeah, he lives in Northern Virginia. So um, he's he's not um, within the security industry in the sense that um, he's doing network security. Um, but through his work, through um, you know his reporting. He has become a valuable resource for our industry, and I think right. that he writes very well. And yeah, he he's presents. he's one of the things that I read every day. So, definitely. so for someone to kind of do, you know, I would understand if you were a vendor and you came out with a product and you're like, "Look, I'm I'm the king AV. Come try to attack me." You right. Know, you're right. right. So, but. Sad, funny story, but, you know, a little, little scary. <laughs> yep. So the other one I want to talk about was how I became a password cracker. And, um, you know, you you did the uh, the ethical hacking, right? No, you, it was you. I was the one you did that? Well, um, Dennis, Sean. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Dennis a couple did others. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's interesting. Um, this guy who, you know, who he doesn't, he's not computer liter- illiterate, but he's not. He's not like the tech guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, in a day, broke seven thousand passwords out of fifteen thousand or something like that. And he walks through his day how he did all this stuff. And it's kind of interesting to see somebody's perspective of being a noob, you know, at security stuff. And he cracked. That's how he be cracking passwords. Some of, some of the biggest hacks are people stumbling. Yeah. You know, they're. He said. I, he said, "I'm the biggest crypt kitty there is." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, and you would be surprised um, how some of the large enterprises have an old vulnerability sitting on them that you right. know, an attack, and and I think what's saving them right now is that an attack vector that is five or six years old, people have forgotten about it. But you yeah, know, you, you'll be surprised how many um, enterprise networks are vulnerable to it. So you blow the dust off of it. Throw it out there, and like you said, script kitty. Right. So, and seven thousand passwords. That's, yeah, he, that's pretty impressive. After, after he figured it out, it ran like really fast. He he spent really hours trying to figure out how to make it work, 
And after he did, he couldn't believe basically what he was doing. He wasn't uncompressing the files. He's trying to. Oh. But I mean, don't we have a security 101 tip on that? Password cracking? No, no. Pass on, on good, strong passwords. Do uh, we have I think a we do. I think we do. Yep. Yeah. So, um,. Right, we, we if have we a, don't, we'll do one. We'll, we'll have one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the, every every environment has their different requirements um, on the complexity and the strength, and and um, you know, as computers become more and more integrated with the um, work workforce, you know, um, they're going to have these layers of security. Um, what I find though is is is, uh, and I know a couple people that are just guilty is is all get out. Um, they have a very good complex strong password at work because work makes them do it. Right. When they get home, they get on. They don't yeah, do well, When they go home, it's one, two, three, four. Right. And I'm like, are you serious? Really? Right. Didn't you, you know, learn anything? Yeah. And you know the the personal information, the personal surfing, their online banking, their online purchases, and yet they're using passwords that are so weak that you know. Right. They're they're inviting someone. Right, exactly. So, we'll we'll check on that on Security One Hundred and One, and and uh, if we don't find a password, we can throw one together real quick. Um, yeah, I, I think a, I think there is one on passwords, but I can't remember exactly. Yeah, I have a, a lot of good tips that go beyond, um, you know, your special characters, all caps, lower lowercase. Right. So, um, then we can put together a one on one on that and help people. And the a lot of the recommendations that I have that also create strong passwords are. are um, they um, help you remember your strong passwords. Right. There's a bunch so, of tricks for that, too. Yeah. So um, so you can subscribe to get us automatically. You can get Security Decoded delivered automatically to your favorite device by subscribing to our netcast. That's your favorite podcast directory like iTunes. Um, also subscribe on your YouTube, our YouTube channel to get regular updates as well. If you listen to Stitcher Radio, subscribe to get um, used to get Security Decoded automatically every week. So um, we also have a Twitter account that you can follow to get the latest news and information. You can find all the details by going to securitydecoded.tv. Um, if you have a TiVo, you can also watch us by getting a season pass to Security Decoded. And more ways to watch and listen are on their way. So, And this week, uh, well, actually last week, we joined uh, techpodcast.com network of shows as well. And plus Justin.tv. And Justin TV, where we're streaming live, Justin.tv, 24 hours a day. Yeah, so I'll have to update that on our so we can yeah. include that the Justin TV is a regular part of our. Uh, That's right. Yeah. So um, so we're doing Tech Podcast here. Oh, yeah, tech, TechPodcast.com is a network, another network. Yep. And our shows are now on there. That's great. So, um, you know, the more ways that we can deliver this um you know people aren't just confined to an itunes yep. they have We're trying to expand you know, it all the time so uh, we're going to shift into malware and phishing okay um and we've had a lot of hot topics um hit the media and and when you see that you see a shift in the phishing campaigns and spam and then we also see uh, some new malware like we said it's it's you know what we catch is what being is what's being reported um, so the next web, which is a, a site that we recently found, had really great information on a new OS X um, Trojan injects ads into pages into browsers that are commonly found, like Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. Um, this is this is interesting because we usually talk everything Windows, 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 right. Windows. Finally getting a Mac thing. Yeah. I think it's gonna happen more and more as time goes on. Yeah, but this you know, this is crafted specifically for Mac. Right. And um, this isn't crafted um, to go cross platforms. It's Mac. But um, I got to say, it's it's probably founded from a Windows exploit because of the fact of browser injects and pop ups have been around probably as long as browsers have been on GUI interfaces. Right. So um, the new Trojan has been discovered that targets Max installing um, Adware plugins. And what it does is it's crafted specifically for the biggest, most common browsers found on Max, which are Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. Um, what they're trying to do is, is, is they're um, trying to trick users into clicking ads. So um, it's, it's one of those where somebody's making money by driving traffic to a site or a face Oh, survey. it's like a click, click, yeah, click campaign? A, yep. Um, but what's interesting, and they said it's, it, they don't know if it was 
that complex or if it just happened that way. But in the article, one of the fake ads was um, specific to um, Apple. One of the fake ad fake yep. ads was so the the fake ad was um, gave the appearance of Apple and um, Apple mobile devices, and this happens to be and most uh, people would think of Apple as being safe. Yeah. So and then this is this is an attack that's crafted for Max. So right. um, you know they're not sure if somebody put that much thought into it to say, well, if I'm going to inject Max, then I'm more than likely going to get a click if I can steer people to something that looks like a legitimate ad. Right. Black. Absolutely. So um, it was actually discovered by a Russian security firm called Doctor Web, um, and what is more important is, is like you said, is, is I guess we're going to see more and more of this, and that's exactly what they're saying. They're saying that this is actually a part of a um, growing trend where they're seeing um, malware yeah. that's been vetted on a Windows. Right, moving it, and moving it over to the Mac yeah. now. So I don't know if, you know, we'll see um, – it's not something as complex as, as Korea where it crosses the, the Linux and the Windows um, where we'll – you know, Java exploits, of course, are platform independent, but, you know, to actually see, you know, installed Adware plugins that are multi-platform, do you think that they'll still stay targeted, maybe vetted I on Windows? I think so, Windows but, you know, a plugin and... can be fairly easily taken cross-platform because, like, Firefox and Chrome, their plugin our infrastructure is, is very similar cross-platform, so yeah. it doesn't take much to convert it over. So I think that'd be one of the easier things to convert over would be something like uh, like that. Yeah, but I, I kind of wonder if somebody is trying to craft something a little more specific because with all the like I said, all the noise on um, you know Java, everybody's saying disable your Java, turn off your Java. It's sort of looking for new avenues now. Yeah. So um, you know if Java does start to get disabled automatically, you know um, now I I lose that cross platform functionality. Right. right. Yeah. So. Um, so um new pope spam oh yeah so yeah. they the new pope so has launched a spam campaign yep <laughs> so hot topics hot topics hot topics and i and i gotta say something that we don't have on here um that i will guarantee you is circulating right now because of what's coming this weekend i bet you there's an easter spam there is a easter spam did not send it to you I didn't see one. Oh, uh, there no. was an Easter spam. Yeah. I'm gonna send it to you. Yeah. But, so yeah. Um, you just gotta follow the holidays, uh -huh. um, and then in between your holidays, you gotta watch your hot topics. So um, this one comes from Trend Micro. So Trend Micro has detected a spam campaign that targets the hot topic of the newly elected Pope, Pope Francis. But it's it's um, we'll, we'll get into some details, but. You know, the spammers really are doing a good job. We've seen from this this past holiday season where um, they go way out of the way to make it look like FedEx or they go way out of the way to make it like UPS. We reported on the um, Germany um, phishing campaign that crippled the site because of the fact that they did such a great job of spoofing basically Germany's version of FedEx. Um, this that one was, That was two weeks ago. I think we yeah, did that, right? was it two, yeah. yeah. This one actually um, – I just touched your computer like an iPad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this one um, actually comes in the form of um, what appears to be news media, CNN.com. Um, uses the CNN.com logo, gives really, you know, um, visually a good a good appearance of, mm -hmm. hey, hey, here comes a new news topic, and it's the spam, whether you're Catholic, non-Catholic, or anything like that. This is a world-changing event. Um, right. You know, regardless of your Everybody religion. was watching. Yes. So, um, and it's littered with links. So I. Well, that should be your first sign. Yes. Well, may not to the average person, but you know. So, um, I got I got to throw another um, little prop in here. I know Mike has done a um, security one on one fishing, and it is very, very, very good. And um, after this, I would really, um, if you have any questions about it, just go to the security one on one on phishing and spam. Um, and if you have any additional questions, you can contact us and, and we can either update the information or do a repost of it or do another um, post. But the um, links within the um, email lead users to a site that's compromised black hole exploit kits. So here we go with black hole. So black hole exploit kits um, are basically um, malware bombs. Right. So you see here's your list of info stealers, backdoors. 
rats or remote access trojans uh root kits so it's dropping all this stuff on there yeah and it actually drops a really old one you, you, oh see it? you're not looking for it anymore 2009 you see it yeah. yeah so and that's you know that's taking the chance that um the malware they, manufacturers aren't looking for it anymore that or um somebody actually has to use a um, legacy version because it'll impact an application Right. So, um, the, you know, it's so it, it takes advantage of a uh, um, CVE 2009-0927 for Adobe Reader and Acrobat. So, if you have an environment that um, you know doesn't have a lot of money and can't stay up to date with this, and that if they actually right. patch, they'll break the functionality. Yep. So, um, but the the biggest thing is 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 um, you know go to that security one hundred and one um, episode for phishing because I'm going to tell you the giveaway. So the giveaway in the email, and we like to teach this on our environment a lot, um, is um, basically it's it talks about can the new pope be sued for, and then they throw the shock like sexual abuse or anything like that, but they say can the new pope Benedict. Pope Benedict is the retired pope. Mm-hmm. Pope Francis. So Oops. is the new pope. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> And and we teach you I, things you like that. You know what? I probably wouldn't have caught that myself. So, I actually would have. I see. I wouldn't have. I so, wouldn't have but I, the the only reason why I would have is because it's a part of what I do every single day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people I mean, people send me questionable emails and go, "Hey, what I, is this?" I may have I may have caught it then when all this stuff was going on, but um, now I would just the word Pope to me means it's the same person, so I wouldn't have thought much of it. Mine is as if I see a link, like you said. You know, well, yeah, it's when littered it gets, with links, yeah, you can yeah, go. Well, that's hey, that's my set off, yeah, not the name necessarily. Yep, and um, there's there's ways that you can expose links if you take your time. So, um, spammers and spam campaigns like this, they really want to take advantage of of you're in a rush, um, and I, your your mouse can be your worst enemy. That's because we're all click happy. Yeah, your mouse can be your worst click, enemy. Click, touch, click, or your click, mouse can click, be click. your best friend. So if you yeah. float your cursor over the links, it'll expose it. Right. So, so if you get an email from CNN.com and you float your cursor over the link and it doesn't say CNN.com, you know, uh, I really, you know, would, would pay attention to that. So um, another article that was pr- uh, put out by Symantec and Symantec did, a, they were very active um, these past couple of days, is the new black Facebook so um, yeah, I haven't read this yet. So that's why I was just now just now reading it to try to figure out what it was all about. Yeah, so Facebook got quiet for a little while. I mean, you you had your your surveys and things like that, and we would see things like um, the uh, Osama bin Laden last year. Facebook really ramped up, and we remember we had to do a lot to make sure that we were securing users against that. Then there was the big scam of free pizzas going around. So every now and then you get one that surfaces on Facebook that kind of spreads rapidly. And um, so the, there's a new scam that um, Semantic found, and it's Facebook Black scam spreads on Facebook. So there, you're going to start seeing an influx on Facebook where um, your friends or users are going to send notifications out um, talking about something called Facebook Black. And they have this really fancy graphic for it. Oh, yeah, make it all look all nice and flashy. Yeah. So it's, it's like a new skin for Facebook, the Facebook yeah. Black. So um, it's distributed similar to previous games that they've always seen on Facebook. But um, what they've done is is that the um, users are tagged in a picture that contains a link to an external website. Uh, what they're doing now is, is instead of the link being found within um, the uh, subject, it's, it's actually down as like somebody – putting an additional comment to it. Oh, okay. So um, when it distributes itself, it distributes itself with a comment. And within the comment field um, is the um, actual link. So what it's doing is is, is um, it'll give the impression that it came from you, and then it'll take um, right. one of so, your friends' so all accounts. my friends, yeah. yeah. And that's where it'll, it'll hook in. So um, users that fall into the trap, they're enticed to, once again, click – and install a um, Google Chrome extension, and mm-hmm. that's what they think they're installing. But if you're not using, what if you're not using Google Chrome? Um, then they're, I think they're taking that chance that you are, oh. and so um, okay, you know, if you if you're so on, lesson uh, of the day, everybody, <laughs> don't click links. Yeah, and, that, and don't that's actually click yeah, you and you'll you'll catch it. That's that's a, uh, you know the. 
the three articles we talked about yeah. all require user interaction. Mm -hmm. Click, 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 click. So yep, slowly, you did it to yourself. <laughs> slow your fingers down. Um, so when infected, um, the scam will actually spread itself. And how it spreads itself is, is, is it creates a new Facebook page on the victim's account. And then it has um, some iframe um, coding embedded that it starts to distribute itself to the friends to the to the fan yep. page so it'll it'll so we have Smart. a Smart. yeah we have a propagation method now so basically a worm right yeah and um, a worm that runs inside of facebook or well, it runs in your machine but affects facebook out of facebook too yeah. Yeah. so and um ultimately the um users that can impact it like this get bombarded with the survey scams you know click this click that click this click that and they said your your account just gets bombed um and the survey scans are how they make their money, um, right? Which is right. yeah, they basically hit counts, right? So the more traffic they can drive there, and you know, it hides itself really well within your account. So if you, um, your friends tell you, hey, you just advertise Facebook Black on me, um, Facebook has the ability for users to reach out to their security team. You should report it immediately, and then they'll help you um, identify and then remediate that off of your account because it's it's kind of created um, basically a new Facebook page on your account. Okay. So, um, and then it'll start to send out and then try to distribute itself. So we have a, another black hole exploit kit takes advantage of um, Cryproid financial crisis. Um, another article that comes out from Symantec. Um, black hole, I, I just don't understand how it's it's still functioning when it's a in the end it's a java exploit right um and java is supposedly written to remediate right uh you can so, say that <laughs> you said it not me yeah so and and one of the the exploits we talked about um which was i think affectionately titled by trend micro and trend micro did it on it which was white hole basically it was um, similar in behavior to black hole, except for it didn't obfuscate itself. It just ran right in front of you, you know, and it, it almost, it's almost thumbing their noses at Java going, yeah, try to stop us. Yeah. Really. You know? yeah. <laughs> I got your stuff. I know how to get in. Here I come. I'm walking right in your front door. And so, um, you know, here we got, you know, black hole on, um, an exploit kit taking advantage of cryptoid financial crisis. We got a black hole, um, that was reported, um, that was coming through the, um, was it, it wasn't the Facebook. It was the, um, it was the, the new spam. So, um, it just got, you just got to kind of wonder, you know, how, how good of a job is Java doing? Right. At fixing the problem. Yep. Um, cause if it was truly fixed then black hole should essentially That's fade right. away. Right. That's so right. the fact that black hole is still active in, a new spam campaign that black hole has been discovered and um, taking advantage of a new crisis um, means that they're still selling it on the market. That's right. Someone's still making money off that code because it works. You know? If it works, why change it? Exactly. Not broke, right? Don't fix. Yep. So, um, you know, I, I just goes to speak more to like what you said, just, just disable Java. Right. I mean, truly, what are we losing? I haven't really missed it since I disabled it. So, but I, and, and I, I think what you did was, and I don't know if we talked about it is, 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 um, you actually have two different browsers with two different configurations. I do. Yes. So, and the one that I use the most, I do not have, um, Java enabled on or flash. And yeah, if I need it, I go to the other browser. That's brilliant though. I mean, cause you, you use one where you disable the plugins, you use one where you, you disable those features and you, you know, use that in your daily use. You're essentially, you know, adding another layer of security to your, you know, your, your cyber environment and it's no habit. It's not like a habit or, right. or or new habit. You just have it turned off. And essentially what you'll do is you'll say, well, I need it because, you know, I didn't see this image or I can't watch this video. Then you close your browser, you open the other browser, watch your video long enough, close that browser, then go back and resume. Right. And, um, 
you know, I, you know, people may say, well, now I got to load two browsers, but um, truly loading two browsers, opening one versus the other versus how much time, money, and effort are you going to have to invest when you get hacked? That's right. Absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, and it's not that big of a deal. I mean, it it's one of those things where I'm at. If I go somewhere that I need the link, I just copy it from the address bar, bring up the other browser, and paste it in, and, and just drop it in. Just, yeah. So I, um, I was always concerned, and, and I, I had a lot of reservations about disabling that when when we talked about that, and you know they. Um, I think Java tries to do a little bit of scare tactic on it because they have so many people saying, look, do you really need it? And they'll go, well, you're going to lose your Facebook. You're going to lose your social media. I haven't lost anything. Your... And um, so I, I kept wanting to do the research and I kept watching. And, and um, you know, we talked about um, being able to go into your browser and disabling the um, auto run feature so that um, if somebody tries to run one of these plugins, it'll right. actually pop it, up and, and ask, ask you. Yeah. Right. And ask me. Um, but then there's also another issue where, um, so you update to protect yourself, but what it does is it actually resets you back to default and re-enables autoplay and then you're bombed again. Right. So um, I did exactly what you do. Um, after listening and, and watching your computer, I went home and um, I do have two browsers, but I have two browsers because um, of some of the functionalities or issues I run into with our applications at work. Um, and I reconfigured and disabled on one browser and I left it fully enabled. Yeah, now on I typically browser. use Chrome with the Java in the Flash because it supposedly has the technology to put it into its own memory space. Sandbox it. They sandbox it, yeah. right, exactly. And um, I don't know if that's necessarily the case for sure, but that's why I chose it to be the one that I go to uh, when I want to watch a video or something. And and what I've found is in most cases, I don't have an issue watching a video on YouTube unless I just uploaded it because they in the background do translate it over to HTML5 yep. and then it runs fine in Firefox. But if it's a, if it's a new video, and it, it won't play. Well, and I also think it's some of the issues like um, – when people upload videos to Facebook, it's Flash. So, right, right. Um, you know, and, and so you see your friends post something. So if I have all of this disabled and I don't have it set to run, then what it's going to do is it's going to say, you need to install this. So um, if you know you have the feature disabled um, and then you go to click to install it, it's going to set it across all your browsers. Yeah, now, see, I don't use Facebook a lot, but when I do use it, I use it on a mobile device, like an iPad or an iPhone, yep. and they play fine there. I yep. hardly ever go to it on a web browser, on a full-blown web browser. Yep. So, so um, and that's where you just got to remember um, you know, different browsers for different purposes. Right. So Different strokes for different folks, different yep. browsers for different purposes. <laughs> so um, we have another article from Semantic. Um Basically, Team Spy, um, a backdoor to the viewer. So um, this attack abuses a very popular um, team viewer remote administrative tool to control malware running on your machine. So um, your device is already infected, but now what they're doing is, is they're using Team Viewer. So they're using Team Viewer from Microsoft to do this? Um, I don't know if it's specifically from Microsoft. Well, team Viewer is part of Microsoft. So probably. If it's the same thing, yeah. yeah. So, um, but it's almost like what we talked about earlier where you need administrative control of your your web server using cPanel or something like that. So um, what we're finding is, is that um, malware um, writers are creating their own remote management console into their infected devices. And they're using TeamViewer to do that. And it's yeah. kind of a neat, neat, neat idea. The whole idea so, of TeamViewer is to be able to do that kind of stuff. You take remote, remote administrator. admin. Yeah, remote yeah. admin stuff. So... Um, you're already, you're already compromised. They already have access. So um, more than likely what they're doing is is, is they're either uploading additional code or um, updating the code that they have or, you know, testing you or using you as, as a um, source deployment. So um, the exploit, though, um, as much as it's in the wild, they're saying that um, Russia is the number one target where they're seeing the highest activity on, on something like this. So the roles are getting reversed now. Not Russia is the target, and we're not the target, yeah. and it's not coming from Russia. Hmm. And it's going into Russia. That's weird. <laughs> that is actually kind of weird. It is, and you wouldn't think that um, you know a, a country like Russia, um, where the the economy is already weak, the infrastructure is already weak, um, 
versus the economy and, and yeah, like we're trying to get out of Russia. <laughs> I don't know, I, but <laughs> I I gotta say though, something like this just you know um, sometimes uh, what we see is is we we're catching the trails of somebody um, doing their testing process. You right. know what I mean? So maybe they found um, it was easier to do it in Russia. And, maybe. You know, and they're building this tool up and then they'll come and hit somebody that that's a, has a deeper pocket that's a little bit harder to get after. Right. So and now they've established basically a web console management interface for malware. <laughs> and uh, one of our last topics in, in uh, trending malware and phishing is um, Indian websites um, pursued by fishers. So um, Semantic, again, um, has constantly monitored phishing sites hosted on compromised Indian websites. And what I mean by Indian websites, I mean the um, country of India. So in 2011, um, Semantic um, detailed a study that said um, uh, the compromised sites and um, they did a number, they did a detection, they documented their study from 2011, then they went out and they repeated um, their study in, in 2012 and um, found that information technology is the number one target in higher education is number two from phishing sites that are being hosted or that are sitting in, in India. So um, Semantic has a, a pretty good bead on them um, and basically watches them to help trend what's going on um, to see if attack vectors are shifting or um, here it just appears that um, industry, it's a shift in industry. So um, information technology um, industry is, is just constantly being spammed and, you know, like you guys call me LT. It's low tech, right? All right, right, yeah. So... Um, Information technology companies, you know, they have their layered security. Um, they preach the concept of layered security when all you got to do is hit the user. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then higher education is interesting, though. Um, yeah. And, and what are they getting out of higher education? That's what I kind of wonder. I, I, I don't see um, higher education as, as something that, you know, monetarily you're going to make a lot of money off of No, I can't always say, I just want to figure out what are they getting out of higher education as far as value goes. I mean, most of the people that are going to higher education are broke because of yeah. student loans. <laughs> but see, we, we also talked about an APT, um, the Mandy and APT1 report where um, they found like um, the compromise on Coca-Cola when they were doing a negotiation with Coca-Cola or the compromise for, um, was it Telvent? Because of the um, some of the technology to steal some of the technology, so I wonder if so it's, you're thinking like think think MIT and some of our educations they're trying to get some of the projects that are going on yeah, inside. They, they have you know all, they they really depend on publishing. They really depend on on um, their research. You know, so maybe um, they're looking to just probe for their way in right. and launch yeah launch an APT. You know, you rent somebody's. Um, they're basically their their um, phishing or their spam net. Yeah, they'll throw a lot of things out there and see where it lands. And so, um, other than that, I um, you know we've been really busy at work. Um, we've been watching, like you said, you got the the Easter. We've been watching spams come through. Um, we're seeing, um, you know, an increase in that as. Easter approaches, then with the Pope, um, then with a lot of the great work coming out of Symantec and um, Trend Micro and a lot of the other AV vendors, um, I just got to circle back on the first subject. I just, I since reading it, I, I can't get that out of my head. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a DDoS as so much as someone just blew your computer up. Right. Um, you know. Very destructive. I mean, that's the kind of thing you don't want to happen because you never prepared for that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the the other thing is, is is so this is, this is you know, reach the media starting to, and they were actually some of the first people to report what was going on because I think some of the AV vendors um, weren't too sure what was going on because of the fact that someone just says, hey, I got black screen. So black screen at first isn't going to come across as security. 
So you no, know, you think yeah, some kind, some kind of equipment failure typically when you get a black screen like that. Yeah, so their so help their help desk is probably lighting up before right. security without any idea what what is really going on until they get their hands on one to see yeah. what happened. So there was probably a delay in that, but so the the media was talking about it, and um, I think because the the media um, started to um, really start to gain a lot of information on it, that that's when AV vendors started to step in and say, hey, maybe we got something going on here. Right, and that takes some time to figure out the pattern. Yeah. So, um, so now that it hit the media, um, now that Trend has done a great analysis on it, and they have signatures, they have heuristic tools deployed, they have um, pattern releases that they tell you watch. Symantec does. Um, several other um, security vendors that are within the region um, have write ups on this. It's now what I'm afraid is is somebody's going to say. Well, where else can I try this? And not necessarily, right. um, you know, the the reported attackers in Korea, but another entity. You know, so what if what if anonymous takes it to the next level? So instead of hacktivism, where they, you know, deface your website, what if you know anonymous says, well, I really disapprove of the content to your website, so I'm not going to deface you. I'm going to crush you. Right. You know, and you got to wonder. When, not where, but when, will this be leveraged again? Right, right. It's only a matter of time when these yeah. things. So, so um, let me paint a scenario for you. Uh, what if somebody figures out how to fold this into a watering hole? I have to put some kind of delay on it, otherwise they figure out what watering hole it was. Yeah. So if you would add a delay to it, am I giving people ideas here? It's no, no, no. <laughs> but what I'm saying, though, is just so, you know, yeah. if you did like that, you basically have someone coming to you. You know, yeah, if you do it with a, in a water hole and you put a delay on it. So say somebody like the LA Times, how many people go to their website? How many, it was thousands of people. Yeah. And you wait for a week or two before you destroy the machine. By the time it happens, more people are infected and you wouldn't even know that it was yeah. you know, going to happen. And the source. So. And then, you know, and you, you ask most users, especially on the computer, would you do this morning? They have a hard time answering. Literally, what did you do a week ago? And, and, and not just that. Just think if they would get off the public and say uh, you go to some common government site, like their health care plan or something like that, or whatever they call their benefits. I, can't I know what it is, but I can't remember what it's called. But somehow they get into that and they infect that. So then you have all these people in the government that all of a sudden in one day their screens go black. What's that mean? Uh, That's, that could be horrible. So, yeah. It's just, yeah. And, and like I said, so your first response is going to be help desk. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, and if I was to help this, my first response would be, see ya. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gone. So, I don't want to deal with that kind I of stuff. I a hard drive. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I, I just, you know, reading about this and finding out more information on it, um, you know, I just, I kept searching for more information, searching for more information, um, you know, because you want, you want to be able to pick up on that one piece of information that's going to initiate our response that much faster. Right. You know, um, and protect your network and, and try to learn from not necessarily the mistakes. Because I don't think anybody made a mistake because this the way that this works and the way that this function, nobody made a mistake. Like, you know, black screen. Right. If I have a user that calls me up and literally said, hey, my computer just went black. I'm going to say, well, did you call the help desk? You know, I, I have no other reason to think that right. I would need to get involved. Right. And so um, just really scary um, and, and scary to the point of, um, you know, when are we going to see this again? I, I don't doubt that we won't see this again. Oh, yes, you definitely um, we're going to see it again. Yeah, you're going yeah. to get some copycatters out there and, and right. they're going to say, you know, how can I one up you? Right. So that's the last thing for the night, right? I think that is it. All right. Well, for show notes from this show and contact details and more, uh, go to the securitycoded.tv website and you can get show notes and watch all the other episodes of Security Decoded. Uh, while there, check out the other great shows we have at techzen.tv. We'd love to hear from our viewers and listeners. Uh, you can contact us via Twitter and email. Uh, and uh, while you're at the site, yeah. Getting the Twitter and email, you can also leave us a voicemail at 913-732-3327. And don't worry, nobody's going to pick up the phone. This is all Google Voice, so we just get uh, the email with your voicemail. Uh, if you um, 
want to make a video and send it to us of your security experiences uh, or give us some comments back, uh, just create a video, upload it to like YouTube or Vimeo, send us a link, and uh, you might just see that video on the show in a future episode. So be, since Dennis is not here, no, we uh, we uh, don't have that question at the end of the end of the night. And he's, I gotta say, I almost sweat his questions. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> you know, just don't know what's gonna come at you. I don't. You do, I don't do good with quick questions like that. No, and and there there are things like uh, so f- today's topic. If you were to find that Easter egg, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what color would the Easter egg be related? Yeah. To, to me, it's it's gonna be Korea, you know, and it's gonna be the black egg. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so. so I guess one other note: uh, next week we aren't gonna have a live show. Um, we're not all available next week, so it'll be two weeks no. to the next next live show. And we do record every Wednesday night at six p.m. except for next week. <laughs> and uh, you can always come join us and get in the chat room and chat with us as well. And uh, before we go, I just gotta say, um, you know, go check out Ting. Yeah, check um, out Ting. I really definitely appreciate the support, yeah, Ting. Really, so. really like um, you know that, and and just get some more information on it. And then um, we do have that discount for twenty five dollars off. Right, that's right, twenty five dollars off first bill or your phone. Yep. And uh, yeah, cool. And we will see you in two weeks. All right, bye everybody. For show notes for this show, contacts, and more, go to the TechZen.tv website where you can get show notes for all of our shows. We love to hear from our viewers and listeners. We have an email, a Twitter, and a phone number where you can contact us for each show. For details, visit the techzen.tv website and get the show details. You can also make a video and upload it somewhere like YouTube or Vimeo and then just send us a link. You never know, you may see your video in a future show. You can get all of our shows delivered automatically to your favorite device by going to your favorite podcast website like iTunes and subscribing. Each of our shows also has a YouTube channel you can subscribe to to get regular updates. Our shows are also available on most internet radio networks like Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. You can also watch and listen to our shows on Xbox, TiVo, and Roku. You can even find us on your Zoom.